just be aware of that. We would love to have you join us in, on camera if you feel comfortable. It'd be great to see your faces, but I understand not everybody is able to do that. We do ask that if you could update your Zoom name to reflect your organization, that would be very helpful. And then to start us all off and to get to know everybody a little bit more, I thought we could all come off mute and do some introductions. You can say your name, your organization, and I would love to hear three words that describe how you're feeling today. Um, and if you have any questions that you want to ask up front, now is a great time to do that as well. Um, I will go ahead and get started. I'm Gretchen Schroeder. I'm a Director of Transformation at Transform Health, and we are partnering um, on the Calain Links project today. The three words that I have for today are curious, rested, and open to our conversation. And I will go to Carrie next. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie. Um, I'm a program associate with uh, Transform Health. Um, and my three words, I'll be honest, I'm tired. I still have that uh, Thanksgiving hangover, um, but I'm excited and also curious and excited to get to know y'all. And I will popcorn it to Michelle. Hi, this is um, Michelle from Coke Family Center and um, in Napa. And I'm happy to be here. And I am curious and um, persistent about this funding. I'm also envious about the Director of Transformation title. I, I, I want that title for myself someday. <laughs> it's a pretty cool title, I know. We just updated our titles recently and I was like, oh, I like this. this feels I good. know, I like that. Um, and I'm on my phone right now and transferring to my so I don't, can, so can you pick somebody for, to be introduced next? Of course, of course, okay, we you. will go to Jonathan. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Jonathan, are you able to come off mute? Okay, I'm gonna go on to someone else and we'll come back to you, Jonathan. Um, Karen? Go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and your three words for today. Hi, I'm Karen Bergman. Um, I had two words, curious and excited, and just want to listen in and learn. Wonderful. I'm glad you're here. Are you able to call on someone or would you like me to do that? Oh, um, Nina? Hi, um, I'm Nina Redmond. I'm from uh, Food for Thought, and I'm very excited about this session. Um, we're very excited to be part of the Community Supports Program, and I'm enthusiastic about learning more about it. I love all this enthusiasm. Great. Nina, can you call on someone? Or are you on your phone as well? I just want to make sure folks can see. How about Michelle? Did Michelle go yet? You did go, yeah. Sorry. I gotta, I gotta look and see <laughs> more people. How about Veronica? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I work for Alternative Family Services in quality management, um, and I guess my three words are: I'm excited, uh, I'm happy about uh, all the changes with CalAIM uh, for our clients, and I am full of leftovers, still recovering. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I will call on uh, Paula. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Paula de la Cruz. I'm a project coordinator working here at Partnership Health Plan. And three of the words would be a bit cold, excited and eager to hear our conversation today. I'll pass it on to Janine. Did we lose Janine? Are you still there, Janine? 
Well, I'm going to pop. Oh, there she is. Okay, perfect. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I'm having issues. I had to log in and Zoom and all that nonsense. So I didn't get to hear okay. the questions. So I don't know what three words um, I'm supposed to be giving you. But um, I am Janine O'Connell. I am a project coordinator new in um, community supports, working alongside with Paula. Wonderful. We're saying three words of how you're feeling today. Oh, okay. Um, hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, happy and um, excited to um, hear what everybody has to say today. Yeah, great, thank you. And Jonathan, are you able to come off mute? I want to make sure we hear from you. There's not that many people with this. Jonathan, we're still not hearing you. Um, do you want to type in your information, Jonathan, and we can go ahead and read it out loud to everybody? There you are. And then while we're waiting for Jonathan, we have Amber who just joined. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Amber. We're introducing ourselves. <laughs> Um, oh, oh no, oh. it's Michelle. It's Michelle. <laughs> Thanks. Totally fine. Um, my name is Amber. I am the associate director at On The Move. And my three words um, are uh, fed up, technology, um, excited, and committed. All right. And we have another new folk, a person joining us, Chantel. Um, we're saying our name, our organization, and then three words to describe how you're feeling today. Until you're able to come off mute. One second, sorry. Jonathan? Oh, there you are. Perfect. Sorry, I'm trying to get my, my headphones to pro participate properly, but they don't seem to want to. Um, my name is Coach Boyle. I'm from Aldea, and hopefully I will get my headphone to work in a second. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And one last call for Jonathan. Okay, well, hopefully, Jonathan, you can connect with us and we can hear you in a little bit. So we are happy to be here. I would love for this to be more of a conversation than me talking to you um, this morning. So please feel free to raise your hand, type your questions in the chat, come off mute. We just wanna make sure that we're answering the questions you have and keeping um, everything moving at the pace that you need it to. So please feel free to jump in. Let's move on. So today's agenda, we're gonna cover our objectives for the session and for um, the Cali and Lynx TA in general. We'll do a quick overview of Kelly and Lynx, just so you know who we are and who's funding us and what our goals are. Um, and then we're gonna get into the meat of the, of the TA session around pathways to becoming a credentialed CS provider, community supports provider, and digging into those details. We do have some setup times for Q&A, but again, I would prefer to have you just jump in and ask the questions in real time so we get everything answered. And then we'll have a lot of fun going over um, the stage contracting requirements and provider expectations. So with that, I'll jump into our objectives. Uh, we are going to be talking to all of you today in the first of three sessions to hopefully provide you the TA you need to become a successful community support provider. Um, I know we have folks who are ranging from those who are still thinking about jumping into community supports and be a few of you are already in the process of contracting or even providing services, that is all wonderful. Um, but we're gonna be focusing on how you do your contracting in today's session and we can move on um, in session two and three. So we'll cover today the key aspects of becoming a community supports provider and what the expectations are both from the partnership perspective as well as from the state's perspective and the process for doing so. And then we also have some information on CalAIM's funding opportunities. So we can cover all of these. And if we're missing something, please jump in and ask your question. So let's go into the program overview. And these, we have a lot of slides here, so I'm just gonna go through this quickly, but we will send the slide deck out to you all after the presentation. So you will have all of this and can read through more, or click on the links that we have here. 
So we are a partnership that's being funded by the California Healthcare Foundation to provide TA to CBOs who want to become community supports providers. It's a partnership between Health Begins, Aurora Health Group, and Transform Health, where Carrie and I work. And we are being very generously funded by CHCF. And we have a great program officer, Carlina Hansen, who has done amazing work to support this project and to, uh, to help this come to fruition. So we're very grateful for all of her guidance. Again, just very quickly, we started this project actually back in early 2021. And we finally knew that Cal Lane was going to launch. And we tried to do a lot of listening sessions to figure out what are people's concerns, what are folks you know, thinking about as they hear about CalAIM and becoming ECM and CS providers. And then we launched a TA session um, at the end of last year, trying to look at getting folks ready. So those folks who were part of the whole person care counties or the health homes counties, getting them ready to contract and provide services through ECM and CS. And then this year, we started a different approach. We have two tracks for TA. We have a TA track that's for statewide providers and looking at trying to answer some very generic questions and approach things from a very statewide perspective. And then we've done some county sessions um, and that's what you all are part of today. And our goals here are to advance equity for providers who are providing community support services we want to support relationships, building relationships between the MCP partnership in this case and providers, as well as amongst providers. So if you all you know, can share best practices and learn together, I think that'll be really exciting. And then we wanna to provide to the TA that you need. And each county grouping has been a little bit different. So we've been exploring different topics and trying to help troubleshoot some different issues in the various counties we've worked in. Um, we have other counties. We have Stanislaus and San Joaquin we've worked in, Fresno, and then Kings and Tulare. So we've been really working with groups in those counties over the past probably six months. We have a wonderful website. I'm going to just promote this. I think it's amazing. It has all of the recordings for our sessions, um, both statewide sessions as well as the county sessions. So please feel free to access that. You can download the slide deck. Um, it's a really great resource to, to learn about community supports and enhanced care management. And then today we have some assumptions about all of you. And if this is not true, please let me know. Um, that you are a California-based organization working in Napa or Sonoma County. That you are interested in community support. And this may not be true. This is the one that I always kind of go, oh, I don't know if it's true. If you have a basic level of understanding, if not, we can help provide that. And then one thing that we do ask of you guys is that we are trying to collect information about CBO readiness and how ready you are to contract with the MCP and to provide services. So we have a little assessment tool that we'd love to have you fill out. Um, we can send that out or put it in the chat right now. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie to help us jump into a poll before we get into some of the, the meat of the presentation here. All right, so everyone should see um, the poll number one, and I'll go ahead and just narrate it. Um, how far along are you in the CalAIM community support contracting process with an MCP? Um, number one, we do not have a contract, but are interested in starting the process. Uh, we have not decided whether or not we will pursue contracting. We are just starting conversations with an MCP in contract negotiations, reviewing contract, already contracted with an MCP, or we have a contract and are pursuing contracts with an, uh, additional MCPs. So we'll give just a few more seconds. All right, five more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Perfect. All right, and it looks like uh, we're at 50% of people are already contracted with an MCP. And then um, we have pretty even split of 17% are split between we are just starting conversations with an MCP. We have not decided whether or not we will pursue uh, contracting and we do not have a contract but are interested in starting the process. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and share that so y'all can see it too. Great, thank you guys. And we have another poll coming up right away here. Um, for you. All right, let me go ahead and share that. All right, and number two. Um, please review the list of historically marginalized populations or underserved communities below. Which of these populations represent at least 20% of the individuals your organization served in 2021? And you could check all that apply. So there's Medi-Cal eligible children and adults, dual Medi-Cal and Medi uh, Medicare eligible individuals, BIPOC communities, uh, people with limited English proficiency, rural communities, people who identify as LGBT. BTQ plus, people with disabilities, individuals experiencing homelessness, um, adults with SMI, substance use disorder, or other underserved populations. So I'll give about uh, 15 more seconds for folks to submit their answers. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Let me share the results. All right, and it looks like we have 100%. Sorry, go ahead, Gretchen. No, I think it just looks great. You guys are serving a lot of really underserved communities. That's wonderful. A good fit for community support. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so 100% Medi-Cal eligible children and adults, and then um, people who identify as LGBTQ+, plus, um, and people with limited English proficiency, and BIPOC plus communities, rural communities as well, and other underserved populations. Awesome. Thank you for participating. All right. So let's jump back into the pathways to become a provider here. Um, I do want to take a moment because I think this is really important to make sure that we all are aware of who is with us from partnerships. Um, we'd like to get you guys um, to be not best friends and be friendly with all the, the partnership staff here. So I'm going to turn it over actually to Janine to, uh, to just say a hello. Um, we also know that uh, Debbie McAllister is another great contact person at Partnership for Community Sports. But Janine, if you just want to say a few words about best way to contact everybody and how to get your questions answered, that'd be wonderful. All right, can you hear me, everybody? We can. So when it comes to contacting us for, is it community supports that you're asking about? Yep. Okay, perfect. Yep. So we actually have a help desk. Um, I could put that in the chat, I believe, but any questions or concerns that you have, you may email us at our, our help desk address. Um, anything urgently, I would suggest maybe reaching out to Paula. Um, because I am so new in this role, um, I'm still learning and training with her. She would more likely be a better contact than I at this point, but um, I will definitely let you guys know what that email address is. And if you have any questions, you can uh, just send us an email and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it from there. Wonderful. And Paula, do you want to put your contact information in the chat as well? Uh, yes, of course. And what I was going to mention is if there are questions for community support or even related to um, ECM and hence care management, you can um, send an email to us to callaim at partnershiphp.org and I'll add that information as well. Um, Janine, Debbie, and myself, we are all part of the community supports, but if there are any questions, the Call AIM help desk would be helpful too. And we'll add it to the chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much, you guys. And jump in here. If you want to add anything to this, please jump in as well. So I know partnerships done a great job of getting resources on their website um, for all of the providers for Calain. So let's start with the basics here. What are community supports? And those of you who are already doing services, you probably know this well, but for those of us who are still learning about it, um, community supports are medically appropriate. This is going to be underscored here. Cost-effective services that 
Medi-Cal Medicare plans, in this case partnerships, can offer in lieu of traditional Medi-Cal services, such as admissions to a hospital or a skilled nursing facility. Community supports are not Medi-Cal benefits and they are optional both for a partnership to offer as well as for members to accept. So that's key here in terms of um, who, who has access to community supports. Um, community supports is really built on the success of the whole person care pilot and the health homes program, which both um, ended uh, December 31st of last year. And we learned a lot from those two programs and hopefully those lessons will continue to grow and inform future design. Under community supports, Medi-Cal managed care plans are encouraged to contract with local community-based organizations to provide community support. And the focus is on addressing combined Medi-Cal, not Medi-Cal, medical and social determinants of health needs and avoiding higher levels of care and associated costs. Now, who can provide community supports? We know that you all here today are experts providing these services, and Partnership wants you to jump in and start doing this through the community support services. Um, we're looking for folks who work in the, in the community, so um, FQHCs, housing providers, social service agencies, counties, the list goes on and on. Um, but we're trying to get those folks who are experts in providing these services and working with these populations. And the role of community support providers is vast, and there's a lot of learning that goes on as we jump into community supports. A little bit different than a lot of our typical work that we've had up to now, um, and a lot of the grants that we've had are a little bit different um, than how a partnership is funding these services. So the job really for providers is to first of all decide if they want to contract with partnerships to provide these types of services. And we'll talk about all those important factors that will lead to decision making. And again, these have to be medically appropriate services. It's gonna be underscored. We have to make sure that the folks who are receiving these um, need it for medical purposes. The providers need to deliver critical medical and social services such as housing navigation, recuperative care, medically tailored meals, or community transitions, which have not typically been funded by Medi-Cal before January of this year. And there's a lot of contract and reporting requirements that the state has for providers and that the Medi-Cal Medicare plans have interpreted and tried to create tools and systems to make that process a little bit easier for all of their providers. So there's a couple of different options for contracting for community supports, um, and we can talk about the pros and cons of each. The first option is that the CBO has a direct contract with partnerships and all of the reporting requirements, expectations fall onto that CBO. The second option is a contracting entity or what we call a contracting hub. The hub holds the contract with partnership and then subcontracts out work to other CBOs. Now, if we talk about the option number one, um, this means that the CBO will be responsible for meeting the service delivery criteria, for having the capacity to do the work that's being asked of them by partnership. They have an infrastructure to share data, and they have an ability to bill and meet the reporting requirements, both by the state and by partnership. If we have a contracting hub, we often see that the hub may offer some of the administrative functions for all of their subcontracting providers. So they may do the reporting, the billing, um, all of the data management, and that can be a real big benefit, especially for smaller CBOs who are struggling with that component of community support. Is anybody here working with a, a contracting hub? No? Okay. Um, I'm curious, we're seeing that we're hearing about this more and more, but I have not um, actually seen it in action yet. So I look forward to talking with folks who are doing that. So I'm now gonna jump into something that's a little bit overwhelming and I fully acknowledge this slide is a little bit daunting here, but I do wanna cover that there are um, some of the important documents that are out there. And I'm gonna be really clear that partnership has done a great job of interpreting state guidance and how they're going to be doing that through the partnership model. But I also wanna point out that we do have a lot of state guidance that's really important to understand too, as you think about contracting, if you're not sure yet you want to jump into community supports yet, um, the state documents are really a good place to do some research. So the first one I want to talk about is the partnership community supports policy. And the links are in here, so when the slide deck is sent around, you will get those. 
but that's the great model of care that partnership has laid out of how they're going to do community supports and how providers fit into the system. In addition to that, each managed care plan was required by the state to submit a model of care for community support. While those are not public facing documents, you can um, ask partnership if they would be willing to share theirs and you can see what they have told the state they're going to do. But my sense is that their policy here probably details all that we need to know as providers. The next document that I <laughs> Love and we'll talk more about is our standard terms and conditions. These are the bare minimum requirements that the state has laid out for both managed care plans and providers for contracting for community support. And we'll cover a lot of the expectations both today and in our session next week. This is a great document to refer back to as you're going over your contract, as you're thinking about does this model fit into our, our organization, does it fit into our budget, et cetera. The state also has a community supports policy guide um, that I think is really helpful as well. It does lay out a lot of the expectations for providers for each community support service. So I know partnership has something similar on their website as well. And Karen, maybe you can pop in the partnership website um, so folks can refer to that as well. And then for those of you who are still thinking about community supports, who are thinking, you know, do I wanna jump in, do I not? A big question is, what is the, the payment rate? What, what does that look like? Can I, can I afford to do that with the payment? And so the state has created a non-binding pricing guidance for all of the community supports. So it's kind of the statewide average of what those services will be paid. It's a good reference document. It does not mean that every managed care plan is paying that rate, but it gives you a sense of what the payment rate might look like for partnership here. I think the best option though is to actually reach out to Paula, Janine, and Debbie, and you know, have a conversation about what their payment models are for each community support. Down to the bottom row here, um, we have billing and invoicing guidance. And we do know that the state has put out a policy guide, which of course is good reference, but I know that partnership has also put out a lot of information about what they do, what options they have, and um, what their avenues are for invoicing. So we encourage you all to look at that and have a conversation with the partnership staff. Now my favorite little box here, the dark blue one at the bottom, we have the codes and they're called HICPIC codes, uh, which stands for the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System. And that is what every Medi-Cal provider needs to use for their billing. It's really overwhelming for a CBO who has not done this before to jump into the HICPIC code. However, there's a lot of great guidance and actually partnership has this wonderful deck of slides and there's two slides that indicate which HICPIC codes they need for you all to use when you submit your bills. So I really encourage you all to look at the, um, the guidance that they've provided. And one thing that's really important in community supports is data and how we share data, how we use data, um, what does HIPAA mean, all of that good stuff. So it's important to understand as you jump into this program, um, what those considerations are. And do you have systems that will do that for you? Does partnership have systems you can use? That's a really important thing to explore. Gretchen, it looks like Paula has something to add. It looks like Paula has something to add. Oh, Paula, please. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, again, this is Paula from Partnership. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is um, all the information um, and important documents, it's also available on our website. And we do understand sometimes the information there may be a bit confusing. So we do encourage providers to reach out to us and ask questions. We do um, review and check the inbox daily. So we do try to be um, and handle the questions in a timely manner, but we do encourage the providers to check our website. There is a lot of um, presentations, uh, PowerPoints. We also have our, like I mentioned, our Cal AIM inbox, and we have a lot of resources there as well. Thank you. You have done a great job with offering a lot of information on your site. It's great to see. All right, and then there is some quarterly reporting that managed care plans must do. And of course, they need to get information from the providers to do that type of reporting. So there's some information on what that looks like. So this is a lot of information, so a good reference slide when you get it with all the links in it. But before we jump into anything else, I wanna make sure that we answer any questions you all may have. 
on just what's out there, where to get it, what the DHCS website is, whatever you have, now is a good time to ask. All right, Carrie, do we have any questions coming in? All right, then we're going to jump into another poll. We're just going to do that. We'll move on. Carrie, I'll turn this over to you. All right, so we have our third poll here. Uh, which type of community support services do does your CBO have experience uh, providing? Choose all that apply. We have housing transition navigation services, housing deposits, or housing tenancy and sustaining services, asthma remediation, uh, nursing facility transition, diversion to assisted living facilities, short-term post-hospitalization housing, sobering centers, recuperative care, medical respite, uh, home-based services, medically tailored meals, uh, home-based services, community transition, homemaker services, environmental accessibility, um, and then additional services, respite services, or day, habilita uh, day habilitation. So I'll give folks about 15 more seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. All right, it looks like most are housing centric, uh, housing transition navigation services um, is the bulk of it, 67%. And then uh, home-based services, medically tailored meals, it looks like that's 50%. And then uh, housing deposits or housing tenancy uh, and sustaining services with 33%. Great. And then Gretchen, we have a question from Karen. Is mental health services included in the services to provide? Oh, you're on mute, Gretchen. Mute. Okay, there we go. Now I'm off mute. <laughs> Uh, great question, Karen. So um, uh, mental health services is not a community support service, but the coordination of mental health services would be um, an ECM service. But some of the, you know, housing around folks who are receiving mental health services, some of the other support services that were outlined here, those could be part of the community support for that population. Any other questions? All right, well, let's jump into contracting requirements. So we just talked about what are community supports, all the, the information out there, those resources, um, but what does it really mean for organizations to think about contracting with Medi-Cal managed care plans? And one thing that I wanna emphasize here is that we've seen this around the state is we have a lot of CBOs who want to become community support providers, but there may be some gaps that they have in their data systems and staff training, and that's normal. So I, you know, I think what I'm gonna focus on today is talk about what the expectations are, and I encourage every organization to look at what their gaps are to be able to meet those expectations. And that's a really good thing to think about and plan for and talk to partnership about. We have these gaps. We need a different billing system or a different data management system, or we need some staff training. And partner with um, partnership to think about how do we address those gaps. And there's a couple of different funding mechanisms we can talk about that might fund services to meet those needs. But I think it's important to be aware of what your gaps are and how you need to meet them to become a successful community supports provider. So this is my favorite thing I mentioned earlier, the standard terms and conditions, STC for short. This outlines um, all of the state core requirements um, for contracting for community support. And typically what we've seen for managed care plans is they will take these standard terms and conditions and put them into their contract. Some may add a few additional requirements on that are specific to that Medicare managed care plan but they all have to meet the standard core requirements that are outlined here. And there are four different um, areas that the STCs focus on. I'm gonna go through them quickly today. We'll do some more detailed dives um, in the next two sessions. 
But the first one is around the service delivery criteria. And I think this is a really important thing to start out thinking about and seeing does this fit with our organization's staffing model of our mission, our values, all of that good stuff. So one of the things that we talk about first with service delivery is what are the service definitions? And I think it's important because a lot of our, I'll take housing, for example, a lot of our housing providers do some, you know, generic housing work. They may have a different term for it. It may not be called housing navigation in your organization. Well, the state calls community supports housing navigation. So it's really important to understand what are the state's definitions for the work that you would be doing. How does that fit into your current organization's model? And then I also think it's really important to look at your policies and procedures for your organization. And you may have to update them if you do become a community support provider to reflect the state language. That could be really important. We want to see housing navigation and your policies and procedures um, and your staff training modules. We want to see that language from the state incorporated into your organization. So I encourage everyone to look at the community support they're thinking about doing and look at what the requirements are around staffing and service definitions there. Okay. The third box here is the data sharing piece. Again, this is really important and it's really hard for a lot of our CBOs around the state. Um, there's a HIPAA kind of governs how we use and share health data. And it's important to understand what that means for your organization, what kind of staff training you may need to provide to be compliant with community supports expectations, what does partnership offer to help support that. So understanding what those terms are is really, really important. Now, part of community supports is that you must receive referrals from partnership of who you're going to provide the service to. Understanding what partnership's referral process is, how do you know if you're authorized to provide that service to an individual? That's very, very important. And partnership actually has a lot of information, again, on their website. And they use a term that's called a TAR, a treatment authorization request. And that is the authorization they give you to provide a community support service to any given individual. And oftentimes they have time limits on those TARs. I think it's typically three months. And so if you need to provide that service to an individual for longer than three months, you may need to renew or submit a new TAR to get that authorization. Without authorization, you cannot bill for that community support service. There's also a wonderful referral form that Partnership has on their website that helps you understand what type of information goes into a referral, okay? And that often accompanies the TAR that you're submitting to get someone the service they need. And Paula, again, reach out if you have anything to add here. Um, part of community supports is also providing outreach. And so if you have given, been given someone to do outreach to, you may have only about 24 hours to locate and communicate with that individual. So figuring out what does that mean? How do we do that as an organization? Okay, and there's again some great forms the partnership has that I would encourage you all to look at so you understand what their expectations are for that outreach service. Another piece that we see a lot of is the responsiveness, and this may be difficult for some of our organizations, but the state does put out that they would like to have either somebody on call or have a voicemail box that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So what does that mean for your organization, for your staffing model? How do you do that? Does that make sense for how you wanna provide care? There's a few other pieces to that responsiveness that I would encourage you all to look at, but it's really important to understand these little details and how you're gonna be able to do that within your organization. Some more criteria here for service delivery, coordination, which is really, really focused on for community supports. How do you coordinate with an individual's ECM provider, with their primary care physician, with whomever else um, they're receiving services from? And I know there's a great provider portal of partnership that may help facilitate that coordination, but not every provider or service that they're getting may be in that portal. So it's important to understand how do you communicate, how do you coordinate care? There's some cultural competency requirements the state has, um, especially around languages. So just be aware for the services you're providing, what those are. Non-discrimination, pretty standard language that you'll see in most contracts. And then another piece that's important is transition planning. So as folks receive their community support services, let's say they're in recuperative care, that after 90 days, they're gonna be exiting out of recuperative care. What is the plan for them after that point in time? And the state really puts the emphasis on 
the community supports provider to do that transition planning. So be aware of what that is and what the expectations are both by the state and by partnership. And then needs identification. We know there are a lot of providers out there who see additional needs in the members they serve. So what are those needs? How do we help folks access the services they need, whether it's part of a community support or whether it's through the food pantry or other means to help them get their needs met? Any questions here? All right, well, let's go into the next FTC topic here, which is quality and oversight. And the state has laid out some good guidance here, but I have to say that each Medi-Cal Managed Care Plan interprets a little bit differently. And so, Paula, please jump in here if I'm not speaking appropriately for partnership here. Um, so the state expects that the Managed Care Plan partnership in this case will conduct oversight over its service <clears throat> community supports delivery. Are people doing the right service? Are they providing it appropriately? Do they have the appropriate languages? Do they have staffing as required? So that's really important to do that. And some managed care plans start out when you begin contracting of requiring that you update your policies and procedures. Others require some surveys to be done to see how you're doing your service. Is this making sense that meet the members need? So it's important to understand what those expectations are and how best to meet them in your organization. Um, that is correct. Great. And then our next STC slide is data sharing. It's a really big bucket. So I'm going to do a very high level overview. We'll dig into this more later, but just want to give you some things to think about as you initiate your conversations with partnership or internally to see do we want to become a community supports provider. So the data sharing requirements. First off is the referral process. We mentioned this earlier. Um, you'll be getting referrals of individuals from partnership, and you need to know how to receive that information. And I know partnership has a portal. I think they also do probably some email or fax referrals, but being aware of what the options are and how your organization can receive those referrals and track them is going to be really important. Um, and I think this has become an issue for a lot of community support providers. They start out small, serving maybe you know 20 or 30 individuals, and as they grow, it becomes more of a challenge to track all this information. How do you know who has the authorization? How do you know um, for how long? What is the timing for each individual? So be aware of all of that as you go into community support. All right, last big bucket, payment. And I'm going to say payment is evolving. We're seeing a lot of really interesting things happen as folks delve into community supports more and start doing more um, billing and get paid for more services. So I want to talk about all the things to think about as your organization thinks through community supports. So we mentioned earlier that both the state and partnership want you to use those HCPCS codes. Really important to do. Ideally, we have organizations who can submit their invoices or claims, as we call them in the healthcare sphere, electronically. But we know not everybody can do that. And I know Partnership has an Excel spreadsheet that they use for folks who are not able to do it electronically. But we want to make sure that every organization can collect and track the information needed to bill. Um, and I would say that most of our organizations have to work with their managed care plans to really dig in and understand what their needs are, how they meet them, and sometimes it can take a few months to get those payments flowing because you've learned the system. The other thing that we have seen a lot of um, interesting conversations about is how do we track what we've been paid for? So we submit our claims, we get paid electronically, but maybe we didn't get paid for all the claims we submitted. How do we start to dig through and trace what was paid and what wasn't? How do I follow up? So all of these things are really important to think through. How does your organization do that? Um, and what systems do you need? And Paula, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, and just to add, um, we do offer claim training uh, for all providers. Uh, and those who are interested um, to know more about it, um, please submit your questions as well. But we do offer trainings for how to submit the treatment authorization request, as well as how to submit claims. And as you mentioned, we do have the option to submit the claims um, either electronically. Uh, for those that don't have access to submit it electronically, we do have the Excel spreadsheet. 
And we do um, show it to the providers and we try to make it as easier as possible for the providers. Yeah, you guys do a great job. And I wonder, Paul, if you could put the link into that Excel spreadsheet so folks who are just thinking about yeah, of course. Support, they'd be able to look at it and see what am I required to submit for claims. And the state has a list of minimum data elements that every provider has to, to meet to submit a claim, and we'll cover those in more detail, but there, there is a list out there, and it's just important to understand what that is. So I think that um, the spreadsheet the partnership has will cover all of that for you as well. Um, there's also some timelines that are outlined by the state about when um, managed care plans have to pay. And it's not the same as how we usually work with our county or our um, foundations for grants. So just be aware of the timing of all of the payments and if that works for you and your model. And I, I do apologize to interrupt you. I just wanted no, no, to share. Um, <laughs> um, I cannot share the link. It's like it doesn't share um, or provide me a link, but it's actually on our website under provider resources and training material. It's under other links, and you'll see ECMCS invoice template. Wonderful, and I really encourage everyone to look at that, even if you're um, able to do it electronically. That at least gives you some information about what's expected. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the state has put out some non-binding pricing guidance for all community support services. And this is a national, or not national, a statewide average, so to speak, of what they believe payments should be for each community support service, but we know it varies by region tremendously. Um, so this will just give you a sense of what's available or what's recommended, but does not tell you what partnership will be paying or what you can negotiate for a rate either. Um, I think the key is to talk to partnership, engage in conversations so you understand what their specific payment models are. And I also just want to spend a few minutes going over some fairly standard payment um, models that we see in community supports. Not all are familiar to CBOs or comfortable yet. Um, we saw a lot of this um, early on with organizations trying to figure out what each payment model means for them and how does that benefit their staff and their organization. I'm just going to cover a, a few key ones here. Um, the first one is a bundled payment. It's called per person per month, per member per month, PMPM PM is the acronym that's often used. And I think actually, Paula, you guys have a different um, definition for it. Uh, so we have the PMPM PM as per member per month, which means that the okay. providers will get one payment uh, for each of the members uh, per month. And you don't do it on a on a calendar month. You do it on the 30 days from the person's authorization for treatment, right? Correct. So if an authorization starts from uh, November 29th, on December 29th, that would be considered one month. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Each MCP does it a little bit differently, so it's good to know the differences here. But that means that you get just one payment per month for each individual you serve. And so whether you see them every day for five hours a day or you see them once during that month for 15 minutes, you have a set payment for that service. The next payment model is a fee for service or a per unit that can be of time, it could be per meal, it could be um, looking at just the individual um, yeah, I think increment is what we often see a 15 minute increment you're paid for. So that's a little bit easier to process so that if you have the more intensive individuals you're working with, you get paid perhaps per time period. And that may help you understand what your payment could be. And then the third one is a cost-based reimbursement um, up to a cap. And we often see this with housing deposits, for example. But if you're going to work with somebody and do housing deposits, you have up to, let's say, $5,000 that you're able to uh, spend on that individual's housing deposit. Um, and sometimes MCPs require reimbursement of those dollars, and some will put it up front. It just depends. And I don't know, Paula, if you have a standard uh, way you do it for housing deposits or not. So for housing deposits, the way that we are doing it is um... – we do ask for the providers to submit the treatment authorization request, also known as the TAR, and let us know the amount that the housing deposit is for. Um, if, for example, the deposit is for $1,500, you would put on the TAR the $1,500 amount. Once the authorization gets approved, the provider can go ahead and move forward with the payment 
And with the receipt or um, the statement um, stating that they have made the payment, they can actually submit their invoice for reimbursement. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. As providers think about that and what does that mean for, for them to provide that service? Any questions on these payment models? All right. So let's continue on. So if you are still thinking about becoming a community supports provider, I think there's kind of three areas we want to focus on. Um, what are the benefits of being a community supports provider? I'm going to open this up for folks to jump in and answer questions on since we have people who are already providing these services. What are the challenges for organizations becoming a community supports provider? And are there any questions that you guys have that maybe you can ask your peers here, you can ask us or our partnership folks? So let's, let's open it up here. First, with what are the benefits of being a community supports provider? I'm going to open the floor up to anybody who wants to answer. Um, uh, this is Nina Redmond, uh, Food for Thought. One of the things that we really like about it is that we've been able to help a lot more people. We have um, very specific programs for people who have HIV or people who've been in the hospital and so forth, but this is an opportunity for us to serve um, people with healthy food from a wide variety of conditions. So that's been really exciting about it for us. That's great to hear. And this is just a comment uh, fr coming from the managed care plan. For providers that are interested in community support or at least are thinking in contracting with us for community support, we do encourage providers um, to let us know. And also, we wanted to make it a, a simple and easier for the provider. If the capacity that the provider has is small, um, we will take the capacity and we do send a capacity report on a monthly basis. And that's how we actually refer members. We will not refer any more members than what the capacity report says, unless the provider lets us know that they're able and capable to um, accept more referrals. So we do take that into consideration as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Anybody else wanna share what they think the benefits are to being a community support provider, whether you're already doing it or whether you're just thinking about it, what's attracting you to becoming a CS provider? Hello, do you want to share from the from the partnership side what the benefits are to doing these services? Uh, yes, just to simplify, the services that we are currently offering uh, Partnership Health Plan are the housing transition navigation services, housing deposit, the housing tenancy and sustaining services, the short-term post-hospitalization housing, recuperative care, also known as medical respite and medically tailored meals. As of January 1st, we'll go live with, um, January 1st, 2023, we'll go live with respite services and also personal care and home make it services. Um, we try to simplify um, and make it simple for each of the definitions. So for housing transition, it would be helping the member find a home. For housing deposit, it's for the member to secure the home and housing tenancy to, for the member to be able to keep the home. Uh, for short-term post-hospitalization, uh, for any member that is exiting the hospital and they're able to continue um, recovering on their own, then we would provide a short-term um, housing. For recuperative care, it's a little bit more so um, for the member who needs assistance while getting better after exiting the hospitalization. And so they would be more so provided with uh, a place to stay, meals, and um, the assistance for medically tailored meals, as it says, is just suited to the member's needs. And for respite services, it would be for the person that cares for the member who is um, ill, um, just to give them a break and be able to um, tag that person and be able to, for the person to be able to do what, whatever they need to do. And then for personal care and home make it services, it's just, to help the members with anything extra that they may have, meaning tours or even um, being at their home, bathing, cooking. So we do try to help members as much as we can. Um, we do have a fact sheet here at Partnership and we can share it as well. And I'll share it with the link. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Paula. All right, let's go on to challenges. What are some of the challenges that you guys are thinking about for becoming a community sports provider? One, one so challenge. The data. One, one challenge. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is Diana Redmond from Food for Thought. One challenge that we're having is that we get a, um, you know, we get the, the TAR approved for a certain date range. So, you know, it's 12 weeks or whatever. Um, but it often takes us a week or two to get the client signed up. So even though theoretically they could have 12 weeks, it often is more like 10. Um, so I don't know what the workaround is for that, but that's just something that has come up that it hasn't worked as well as we would hope. That's good to know. So that can be. And then do you, can you apply for a new TAR or renew it? How does that work? Um, you know, we're a little bit unclear about that. We were sort of hoping to find a few clients who are pretty clearly in need of, you know, services ongoing, like, for example, someone who's, whose health condition isn't really going to resolve after 12 weeks. But we haven't actually tried doing that. But I'd be interested in hearing from partnership about what, you know, what they're looking for as far as, um, as far as renewals go. Hello, this is Janine. So um, once the TAR is actually submitted to partnership and you provide that date range, if you are unable to provide services during that date span, then what you would want to do is just submit a correction TAR to partnership and basically specify the dates that you are wanting to start the services. That way you can get the full weeks that you want to provide the services for the member. And the way to submit a correction TAR, you will just fax over or submit if you're doing it on the portal, you will submit a correction through the portal. If it's a faxed TAR, then you'll just fax over a cover sheet with the TAR number and specify the dates that you want the TAR to be changed to, and we'll go ahead and get that um, updated for you. Oh, great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Great information. I like how flexible you are, partnership to work with the providers and try to find some workarounds. It's really helpful. Yes, and Any just other another quick thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, if for some reason you do need to extend out the authorization, then it would be the same thing. You would just either submit a new TAR um, with the information specifying that you're extending it out, um, and you would provide the additional information as to why the member is going to have services extended, or you can fax in a cover sheet with the TAR number and specify on there to please extend it. That's a little bit easier for us over here so we don't get confused with multiple TARs. So if you just do a cover sheet, um, TAR number, um, what you are wanting to extend, um, and also include updated notes or um, anything that you have to explain to us why the member needs additional services or additional date range, then we can go ahead and get that reviewed for you. Great, okay, well, thank you. Thank you, that's really helpful. Are any other challenges folks wanna raise or things that you're thinking might be a challenge as you think about contracting with partnerships? And again, I think it's important to just identify what your needs and gaps are. Um, I think so that you can start to work with partnership um, to understand how do we address those needs. It could be a staff training need. It could be need some support with um, some provider portal training. How do we get on? How do we use it? All of that good stuff. So I think it's important to identify that and then begin to work with partnership on, on how to address it. And, and this is Paula. Um, just to add also, um, that is also why we created the referral form. Um, in there, the providers are able to share as much as they uh, would like for us to know. And also, they can explain as to why the member, for example, with the extensions, they can explain as to why the member will benefit from the services. Even though the uh, community supports are in lieu of a traditional benefit, we are open to um, listening to listen to the providers and read what they uh, have to say for each of the uh, authorizations. Yeah, and, and no, no question is a stupid question. If you have any um, 
issues or you're running into any barriers, please email us. Let us know. We are here, um, you know, Monday through Friday, eight to five. We are here for you um, to make it a smoother transition um, for any of the new services that you are willing to provide our members. So please just reach out. Wonderful. Love it. All right. Anybody else want to ask a question or identify any challenges you're thinking about? All right. Well, if you think of anything, please jump in. Let us know. We have a lot of great information here from partnerships, so it's really great to I'd love to have you and Janine here to help answer questions. All right, so let's go into um, our additional needs survey. Um, we would love to have everybody fill out this additional needs survey, and you can pop that into the chat here. It's about a two-minute survey, but it would really help us understand what your questions are, what you're thinking about, so we can tailor our next session to meet those needs and to make sure we're giving you the information that you need um, to become a successful community support provider. Anything else? Any other questions that have popped up? STC questions? Things you're just curious about that you'd like to learn more about? Okay, well again, um, we have a really wonderful partnership team here. Um, Debbie is Part of the team, Janine and Paula are also here today. So please make sure you reach out with any questions you may have. Um, they are there to help. And I think that's a really great resource to take advantage of. All right, we have one final poll for you guys. I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie to help launch that. Okay. So our fourth and final poll question, uh, we want to know what you need support with and please select the top three curriculum choices that can support your contracting readiness. Um, so top three of the following, identifying and connecting CBOs to nonprofit intermediaries and TA networks for community supports providers, opportunities to braid and blend funding, um, if, for example, PATH funds, MCP, IPP funding, community foundations to support CS related capacity building among CBOs, um, helping CBOs understand opportunities to leverage and braid CalAIM related infrastructure funding and TA opportunities, CalAIM populations of focus and community support services, uh, support CBOs and MCPs to identify system and policy barriers to local CS delivery and coordination, opportunities to improve health equity in Medi-Cal, um, for example, racial di health disparities, MCP, equity-related performance measures and equity interventions, payment models, rates, and systems for uh, CS providers, billing and invoicing requirements uh, and systems, local service model challenges, impact of staffing model, caseload variation, case duration on cost and performance, local coordination requirement, and challenges facing ECM and community support providers and opportunities to improve coordination and learning among MCPs, counties, and ECM and community support providers. Right, so I'll give folks about 30 more seconds to submit their top three curriculum choices. Oh, it will only allow you to select one? Weird. Okay, if you want to just put, um, pop in your remaining two, I'm sorry, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, but if you want to pop in your remaining two choices in the chat, um, then I we can make note of that. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why it did that. Thank you. Cool. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And again, if folks want to um, put their remaining two choices for the curriculum in the chat, we can make note of that. I don't know why it's only allowing um, to select one, but 
Um, so it looks like the top choice is uh, just from the poll payment models, rates, and systems. Um, but then we also have local service model challenges, identifying and connecting CBOs to nonprofits and intermediaries, opportunities to improve uh, health equities and Medi-Cal. So yeah, we'll incorporate um, the responses in the chat into the poll as well. Thank you for participating. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so let's jump into our next step here. Again, we would love to have you guys fill out um, the two minute additional needs survey. Um, Carrie put it in the chat, but you can also access it through the slide deck and we'll send that out right after this series here, or after the session rather. Um, and we'd love to have you join us next week for session two. We'll dig into some more of the details um, on some of the topics you've raised. Especially around the funding, it sounds like we can have a really good conversation about blending and braiding funding. So I look forward to that. And if you have any additional questions or follow up, you can email us at calame at healthbegins.org. Um, and that would be really great to hear from all of you. Any final questions? All right. Well, a special thanks to all of the, the Calium Links team here. We really appreciate everything that you do to make this possible. Thank you to Partnership for being here and answering the questions. It's really lovely to have this good conversation. We'll send the slide deck out shortly after the session. And we have an appendix on the slide deck that's a lot more information and links for DHCS documents. So please make sure that you check those out. And I will look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thank you so much for coming to our uh, session today. Thank you for having us. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, thank you.